take really advantage uh, of what's, uh, what's currently out there uh, in, in, in our forest, uh, the, actual, uh, the actual working forest. And we, we very often do uh, uh, what we call retrospective studies, where we don't know exactly what was there before and what actually happened, but with uh, forensic uh, tools, we try to reconstruct what happened. But, but to take advantage of 10, 15, 20 years of response to, to, to forced harvesting. So one, one, one of this very important uh, project that we, that we did uh, started uh, in, in 2012, so our very first project uh, in partnership with, uh, with UNB. We looked at stands that had been treated uh, in, in the last 10, 20, 30 years in, in northern New Brunswick. Uh, and, and try to reconstruct what was there before by looking at stumps and trying to uh, trying to, to, to build the stand back up to what it was before. Look at what happened in terms of treatment, and look at what what came out what came out of that. How did the forest uh, grow? So I'm going to talk for a few minutes here about, about this one experiment uh, that we did. Uh, 37 stands in, in northern New Brunswick, and every stand had had received some type of partial treatment from almost remove nothing to remove quite a bit. And, and uh, try to understand what happens in the uh, dynamics with, uh, with satellites. So you're, you're, you're familiar with that graph by now where uh, we look at seedlings that get recruited into saplings, and saplings uh, become big people and they become commercial sized trees. And, and that, that, that study we, we uh, we looked at uh, look at different factors. So same as presented by Stephanie and presented by Maria Andre. But this particular treatment or experiment, is there much feedback here? Yeah. Um, so we look at uh, a few factors and mainly the harvesting method, uh, what happened to the vegetation, and then uh, what site uh, were we were we on. And again, for this uh, this trial, this uh, this study. We look at mostly the saplings. Uh, so what what we found? So by looking 10, 20 years after treatment, trying to reconstruct the past, uh, we made a couple of conclusions on those 37, 39 blocks. Uh, so the harvest intensity, how much trees, how many trees you remove, or how much you take out, uh, and how much is left, has a big impact on on saplings. Uh, and then there's an interaction. We look at Paul Arp's uh, death to water table. Uh, that product of his seems to fit everywhere. It's kind of a silver bullet to explain a bunch of things. But we saw not only uh, the intensity of harvest was a big uh, factor, we saw that it, it got modified depending on death to water table. These were all hardwood stains, by the way, but still there was, was a gradient of death to water table. Uh, and, 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 and that changed the ranking and the response from one species to uh, to the other. So, so what we uh, what we did there's a there's a very important relation, relationship that we we found out of that study. And, and and guess what? We did not invent anything. When you look at the literature in the U.S., New England, uh, Quebec, Ontario, 30, 40 years ago. What we found here is very, very consistent to what is, is understood, but it is regional. It's a very, very important. So we look at we look at the uh, the harvest uh, intensity in terms of basal area removed, percent basal area removed from do almost nothing to take out everything, and then we looked at the density of saplings 10, 20 years after after treatment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some some results. Uh, the first response is is red maple. Red maple seems to be happy to be red maple. It, it does good everywhere. Remove a lot. Remove not a lot. Red maple is gonna be is gonna be what it is, and it's it's prominent elsewhere. There's a little bit of a little bit of a relationship here between uh, when you remove a lot, you tend to have a little bit more uh, sugar or red maple soy. Sorry for the folks there on my left. I tried not to ignore them. Um, so, pretty standard response curve. Um, Ted Needham at UND and a graduate student want to look at that. They want to look at red data. So, we're going to build a project to 
Next one is, is yellow birch. Well, as if we quiz everybody here today, and I think Stephanie did, uh, if you open up a lot, uh, what, what species uh, gets established right away? Well, the yellow birch is pretty, pretty opportunistic. So, so that trend is not, is not surprising. So the more you open up in a hardwood forest, hardwood stand, uh, the more yellow birch you're bound to get. Of course, it's all modified with all these other factors. Um, sugar maple, interesting, interesting uh, uh, trend. So, if you don't open a lot, you'll get some sugar maple. If you open a fair bit, you'll get a lot of sugar maple. And if you open up too much, uh, you have less maple. And Chris Noffel alluded to that earlier in one of his his questions. So, so the sweet spot if you want to grow sugar maple. Nobody else, everybody does, is in this window. I and mean, Chris nailed it. Uh, that's the window where, uh, in terms of percent vision area removal, you'll get, you'll get most of uh, it. <coughs> beach. So, as you know, beach is my nemesis, it's my kryptonite. Uh, beach, when you don't open up a lot, you have beetles. You have beach in your stand already. Beach is the king of small gap openings. Beach will, 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 will win. Every time we try to make tweezers and just remove a few trees, if beach is present, it's going to regenerate, it's going to, it's going to produce uh, suckers, and will turn into saplings. So that's, that's the relationship that we, we, that we found, really. These are the results from that retrospective study in, in northern New Brunswick. Very, very consistent results. Of course, it gets complicated when you look at other things. As I mentioned, uh, depth to water table will we'll, we'll moderate that. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go to that level. But I just want to quickly go to what does that mean, especially with what we saw this morning, a bunch of small studies, big studies. Uh, how, how do we, how do we uh, make sense out of that? And I'm talking here today from the perspective of a civil culturist. So somebody who wants to make sugar label grow here, yellow bridge there, no beach. Uh, beach is good for uh, shady act, but that's about, that's about it from my, from my perspective. Uh, I'm not a civil culturist, but I, I'm talking from, from the perspective of one here, here today. So the conclusions and, 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 and the graphic I just showed really illustrated nicely. Uh, High, high removal will reduce the uh, propensity of beach to, to regenerate, especially where we have high depth of water table on the crest of the hills. You have beach, and then uh, you cut a lot of trees, you have fewer chances to regenerate beach. Uh, higher intensity removals, as we saw, will benefit somewhat red maple, but yellow birch a lot. So these are uh, two obvious conclusions. Um, high um, intensity uh, harvest will have uh, will have some effect on on sugar maple, but not as much as in the case of, of beech. So you can remove a lot of volume, you're still going to keep sugar maple. Uh, and, and, and strategies where we want to keep uh, shade uh, shade uh, mid mid tolerant shade, shade species like uh, red maple and, and yellow birch, you have to explore. Spectrum where you remove more trees, and of course, uh, depth water table will, will moderate all of those basic relationships. So, in light of study A, B, C, D, and, uh, and we hear sometimes things that make us reconsider, say, well, that doesn't match that other study. The study. So, how, how do we how do we deal with that? How do we tomorrow when we go back to our real jobs? Not me, but those who actually cut the managed forests. Uh, how how do we how do we make the best uh, the best operations based on general uh, the general body of knowledge? Well, we all know about civil culture. Here. The foundation is is based on uh, civil culture systems, uh, and there's three big systems. I, I'm preaching to the choir here. You all remember that, and if, if we quizzed you, you would all pass, right? Three basic civil culture systems, even age. Even age is, uh, we don't like the stand we're in today. We want to start over. And we want to start over 
either in one shot or in a couple different shots within 20 years. So if you're talking about a clear cut, a uh, strip cut, which is a modified clear cut, uh, seed tree cut, shelter wood, you have decided that you will create a brand new forest within, within 20 years. How many people here um, will prescribe a shelter wood and not put on your GIS, come back in 2039? Sometimes we use shelter wood term and it's not describing what it is meant to be. So if you call things uh, shelter wood, you've decided this stand, I don't like it, composition, uh, tree quality, or stocking, I'm going to start over it within 20 years. Of course, you all know that. Um, uneven age, or multi cohort. So if you want to keep at least three age classes over time in perpetuity, we come in at regular intervals, normally on a 20 year or so cycle. Uh, we cut trees in every size class, every age class. Release the small, old trees, cut the ones that are financially mature, and then, and then thin the rest. We want to maintain perpetual cover as much as we can over a long term horizon. No brainer. So, even age, I want to start from scratch. Uneven age, I want to maintain that forever. And then, how often does that happen? In all the, in all the tracks of forest that, that you folks see, uh, what's the percentage of our northern New Brunswick forests that are well adapted to do single tree selection and even age everywhere? We're having a roster for the big piece of pie at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. A lot of our forests are, are ready for uneven age. Or not a lot along the forest. Ten percent. All right. I'm not going to have an option, but uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. Ten percent. Not a lot of our forests are well adapted to uneven age systems today. Same thing with uneven age. How many uh, how many mixed and hardwood stands do you feel like I want to clear cut that and I want to I want to establish yellow birch or God forbid plant no roots. <laughs> Not a lot either. So it just so happens, my guess is that the middle, the two-age civil culture system, two-age extensive, will be by far the most prominent civil culture system in the forest of northern New Brunswick uh, as, as, as we know them today. So the goal there, the goal there is to create those two distinct age classes uh, make sure the sapling and the pole size trees are, are, are thin and make sure we harvest the trees that are mature and will lose value by the time we, we come back and then regenerate a new, a new core. Uh, so so what, what does that mean in terms of what we just found out from this, this retrospective study? Well, we say uneven age, whoops, where we do not harvest a lot of trees, we leave a very substantial cover, it fits here. So uneven age, it fits here, and it's very good for sugar maple. Uh, it's not bad for birch and yellow birch and red maple, but it's also very good for beech. So let's be careful where we practice uneven age uh, civil culture. The other extreme, don't like what we have, we want to start from scratch, well, it fits very well if you're interested in growing yellow birch and growing, growing red maple. And it's not bad at all for sugar maple either. And it's kind of terrible for beech. <coughs> Sorry. So, the middle. That's where it fits. And uh, two-age civil culture, we think, um, has a lot of potential for, for, for the majority of the stands that we deal with in, in, in New Brunswick and in maritime provinces and Quebec. Uh, and some of Ontario and the New England. So, what do we do? There's other things that we need to consider as well. So we saw this morning some uh, some teasing of, of, of answers and relationships, uh, looking at season of harvesting, operator competency, and all of those. So they're all important. We need to we need to consider those, and we are actively busy designing studies to understand that. But in the absence of the absolute answer from science, what do we do? Well, we do what the province of New Brunswick has embarked on 
uh, in the last few years, and what Ambassador Real was preaching, and we do adaptive <coughs> management. So, from from best knowledge, from 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 the synthesis, we make hypotheses, we go and test them, and then we go back and and, and learn. So while we wait for the definitive answer from from science and, and research, uh, we have to practice adaptive management. So concretely, uh, and this is what we'll be looking at tomorrow, uh, all day, is uh, is we, we built a framework to practice adaptive management. And it is not perfect, it's close to be right, but at least the framework allows us from knowledge, from, from research, from, from science, to make to make actions in, in the woods tomorrow and, and, and make sure we manage the stay as best we can. So, what we learned about beach, um, the relationships between canopy opening and, and, and beach and depth of water table, uh, we built it in our civil culture prescription system. We have what we call we have what we call the uh, beach loop. So it's it's built in. There's some logic there that you can follow, and uh, and uh, we have synthesized uh, the actions according to what we know from from research. Uh, there's a what I call the intolerant hardwood check as well. So Thin heavily to, uh, to minimize these, but not too much to encourage public. So there's mechanisms in there like that. And then uh, uh, advanced regeneration. We talk about this all morning. That's a topic of this uh, plenary. So, so how do we how do we build that in? Uh, our SPS has has that built in. We don't need to carry a suitcase full of research papers. Uh, we, we 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 went on the at the end of the branch, or we need a leap. We build a system around that. So that's uh, that's the perspective of a civil culturist, and uh, so we're really looking forward to share some of those uh, discussions with you uh, tomorrow. You have questions for me? Okay. Uh, you're welcome to talk. Oh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, notwithstanding uh, what you're getting on the forest floor for regeneration um, with these uh, 35 or so long-term sites, have, have you observed any changes in growth overall on those sites? Uh, are, is, the, is the hard forest growing faster or the same as it was 30 years ago? That's a good Good question, David. So, are we? What, what do we understand of not only establishing new boards, but also the actual growth of, of our trees? And has that changed or improved since back then? And uh, all we can all we can really say is when we look at the increment cores in those in those studies that we looked at, um, the pattern seems to be the same. But by the time a tree has reached 40 to 45 centimeters in diameter, its growth rate is is dropping. So I think in in cases in New Brunswick today, the growth rate is lower than what it could be. Uh, but I think the reason is we have a lot of big trees there that are not growing as much as as as, as they could. A lot of the stands that we look at. Uh, received one or two epidemics of spruce budworm, so there was some, some thinning done by, by the death of blossom bird in there, so uh, I'm kind of answering like a politician, but uh, uh, growth rates are not worse than they were before. Uh, we have some uh, some uh, some hints on what it could be on, under a context of the climate that is changing, uh, and we're working with ERD on, on, on yield curves and all of that. So there's not a big change. Long answer to your simple question. There's not a big change, but it is complicated. So we need to know all these all these factors. Yeah. 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 Yeah